I want to introduce our panel. Of course, we have Mike Mazul, who is a Nikon ambassador and a DSI print ambassador. And uh, uh, Mike is what I call an adventure photographer. Um, he travels all over the world to capture these phenomenal natural happenings, as well as in his own backyard. He's an exceptional storm photographer and uh, just a good all around photographer period. Um, so welcome, Mike. Yeah, thank you guys for having me again. It's always fun. We're also joined by Veronica Cotter, who is a, uh, Veronica, unmute yourself for a second. Okay. Uh, what's, what's your technical title? Uh, EDU education and also the Western Region Sales Manager for Hanamula USA. And I'm based just uh, in Los Angeles. And we're also joined by my business partner, the birthday boy, um, oh, Eric Luden, <laughs> um, who is the founder of Digital Silver Imaging. And uh, he's our an illustrious, fearless leader in this endeavor. Oh, it's great to be here with uh, some of my favorite people. And uh, uh, Veronica and I have known each other for many years in the photo world. So between all of us, you're getting a ton of great knowledge and experience. So we we do hope that uh, we'll get to as many questions as possible. Um, but I just want to say, you know, as a I started this company in 2008 as a fine art custom printing lab and feel really honored to work with um Veronica and her capacity at Hanamule, we're a Hanamule certified studio for our fine art um, inkjet papers. We also do beautiful silver gelatin prints directly from digital files, custom printing, framing, mounting, matting. If it's photographic and you need some advice or help, we hope you'll reach out to us. So um, great to be here and great to have Mike again. Just, you know, adventure photographer is kind of like an understatement. Um, You've got more chutzpah than anybody I know. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, I was also going to tell you, 21 never looks so good on you, man. Happy birthday. It's 22. <laughs> oh, 22. All right, 22. Okay, now that the line's <laughs> over, um, <laughs> why don't we turn it over to Mike? So, Mike, uh, wet your whistle there, and uh, I'm going to mute myself, and uh, we'll take it away. All righty, cool. So uh, thank you guys, obviously, for having me here. Uh, you guys can still see me, yeah, even though we got the volcano stuff going right now. Yes, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, no, my name is Mike Mesuel II. I'm an Icon Ambassador, uh, DSI Ambassador. I am a overall just photography nerd. Um, I've spent, uh, I don't even know, I've lost count of how many years now. I think it's uh, 14 years, I believe, of my life uh, professionally shooting, and that's included everything uh, pretty much under the sun. You know, I started off, my career was with a Easter egg hunt for the city I live in, and now I'm traveling the world doing uh, projects uh, for volcanoes, for National Geographic, and for PBS, and then doing uh, lessons where I teach workshops all over the world from Antarctica up to the Arctic Circle of Norway and Hawaii. And it's it's been a crazy journey. And to think it started with an Easter egg hunt and baby portraits and family portraits. And, uh, you know, I've done professional sports and a uh, lot, lot of live music. It's just a little bit of everything. But uh, my passion has fallen now into landscapes and just anything nature, uh, more so, you know, tornadoes, severe weather and volcanoes. And the footage you guys have seen is all uh, hot off the press, no pun intended, from last week in Iceland. That's been a, a uh, project I've been working on for the last three years, documenting the eruptions out there. So uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get rolling here. I'm gonna go ahead and close down the volcano footage here and go over to a good old Lightroom. So what I wanted to take some time today with you guys is to kind of walk you through an edit and walk you through what goes through uh, my mind in regards to while I'm out shooting in the field and then what happens in the digital darkroom. And I had a photo, I had it all queued up and I can't find it now. But if you know who Bob Ross is, I always reference Bob Ross to any of my workshop students, uh, anybody I talk to really about photography and about how I shoot and how I edit. 
So if you've ever had the privilege of watching Bob Ross, uh, first thing you're gonna remember is his big old fro. And then you're going to remember he had these incredibly beautiful paintings that he created. And he had a white canvas behind him. He greeted you every morning and he talked you through exactly what he wanted to do, what colors he wanted to use, what kind of brushes he wanted to use, uh, where you know maybe this waterfall would be in a mountain and what kind of colors and clouds and of course the happy tree where that would be. And that was all done right prior to any single drop of paint hitting the canvas. And that is something that I carry with me while I'm out in the field and like I said, in the digital darkroom. So what does that mean? Well, that means before I ever set up my camera out in the field, before I ever pull it out of the bag, I have a vision for what I want to create. I take a look around. What do I like in the scene? What do I not like in the scene? What are the colors doing? What are the clouds doing? What are the clouds going to be doing in 15 minutes from now? And then what's the color going to be doing 15 minutes from now? What do I like in the frame and I can control? Or what do I not like in the frame and I can't control? And all of that really helps me get going with what lens am I going to pull out of the bag per se, right? So I need to have that vision first when I'm out in the field. And that helps me create the image. There's also other things, right? Like having patience, having persistence, um, having a knowledge of the area that I'm in and what I'm looking for. So the image that we're going to work on today, and we're going to we're going to talk through the whole post-processing uh, process here. Um, but I want to talk to you about why this shot was created first, which I think is important. So this is from my recent uh, Lafontaine Norway workshop a few months ago. And uh, I had initially take my workshop out to this location because of two things. One, I knew that the forecast for the clouds that morning were gonna be partly cloudy skies, which was uh, quite optimistic for having a sunrise, which you know equals color. And I also knew that this location had a very small window where the tide was gonna work in our favor in regards to the timing of sunrise. So I wanted to come out here at low tide. And the reason being is because at low tide, the ocean obviously retreats out and you get all these really cool sand patterns and it's these like rippling effects in the sand. Now, what I didn't expect was probably one of the coolest kind of compositions, designs by nature that I've ever come across. And that was this look right here, which is this kind of almost like checkerboarded kind of feel to the landscape. So what was happening is we had low tide. So all these ripples in the sand and then we had offshore winds. So the winds was, were blowing from the land off the shore. And that was taking all that fresh snow that had fallen and having it caught or get caught in the ripples of the sand. So it created this really cool, like I said, almost kind of checkerboard repeating pattern kind of look to the foreground, which when I saw that, I told my workshop, right, where everybody hit the brakes. We're not gonna go to the spot we originally intended on. We're stopping right here. And this is where we're gonna shoot. So seeing that, I immediately thought to myself, okay, a wide angle lens is going to allow me to get really low, really kind of pull out all those textures and patterns by being really close and creating a nice sense of depth throughout the frame. And it's also going to allow me to capture some of the sky. So by seeing that and understanding right off the bat, hey, this is a wide angle shot, I knew to throw on my Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter lens, and I wanted to get low to bring out some of the details in the snow slash slush and also create this kind of uh, sense of depth from the closest textures to the furthest textures of the mountains. Now, not to get too far down the rabbit hole of predicting things, but looking at the partly cloudy skies, I knew there's a really good chance that we were gonna have some sort of sunrise color coming in. So obviously I wanted to orientate the group where we were pointing at the sunrise light, which is kind of off to the right side of the frame there. So that's kind of the thinking right there in regards to just the composition. Now, with my histogram, I have that pulled up here in the top right corner of my develop module. You guys can see the histogram looks pretty, pretty darn good, pretty darn balanced. Um, you know, the biggest tip I can give you first thing first, right off the bat, is you guys know your camera, know your histogram. That is going to play a huge role in how you shoot and how you edit and post. So your histogram, if you're not familiar with it, is basically 
a way for you to see the data that is captured within your image. Your highlights, your shadows, your blacks, your whites, all of that is right there. And uh, we were talking about this before the session got going, but whenever I, I do a new camera or I get a new camera, I'm doing a campaign for say the Z8, I'll take the camera outside. I'll take pictures of whatever it may be. It doesn't matter, it'd be a fence post. And I'll shoot really dark and I'll shoot really bright. And then I'll take the images into post and start playing around the dynamic range and see what does my histogram look like here? And how much data do I have available in the highlights and the whites and the shadows and the blacks? And what that does is it helps me start to realize and recognize how much data I have when the histogram looks a certain way and how that is relatable to the scene in which I'm trying to capture. So some scenes are very dynamic where I may have a lot of really bright highlights in there that I wanna control. So I'll shoot a little further to the right and then recover those in post. And it, it's just a matter of understanding the histogram and how that relates to the scenes that you have in front of you. So I hope that makes sense. Just biggest thing I want you guys to take away from that is study your histogram, understand what it should look like in light that is really well balanced and also in light that is very contrasty and how much wiggle room you have in recovering shadows and highlights and blacks and whites. So histogram for this scene right here looks pretty darn good. I wanted to be careful not to shoot too far to the right because I have some pretty bright highlights hiding over there in that valley. So I wanted to make sure that they were controlled and they were gonna be recoverable if need be. And as regard in regarding the shadows and the blacks, there's really nothing too, too crazy going on here. Uh, there's some shadows in between the snow and the ripples. So I wanted to make sure that that was recoverable. So overall, that's what my histogram looks like. Nothing pushed too far to the left or pushed too far to the right. Now, when we get to the editing process here, we go back to Bob Ross. I told you a little bit about Bob Ross in the field, right? Thinking about how I want to shoot, what I like, what I don't like. But when we come to editing, that is so important to have the vision of what it is you want to create before you start moving around any sort of sliders. Because I guarantee if you go into post and you start moving sliders around left and right, you're not going to get what you want when it's all said and done. You're probably going to walk away with some, some mistakes made. So when I look at an image, the first thing I want to do is figure out what needs to be corrected, because that's going to allow me to understand which sliders need to be utilized. So for this image here, I would like to kind of recover maybe a little bit of the highlights that are hiding back in this area over here. I would like to create more contrast in the repeating patterns here. I would like to also bring out some of the texture that is hiding here. Now this image is not focus stacked. Uh, the reason being is what you don't see is the lovely 40 to 50 mile an hour winds blowing us around here. So the last thing I wanted to do was manage focus stacking in the sandy area when we're getting blown around like that. So I, I focused out here kind of mid frame and you guys can see that I'm sitting here at F13. So that gives me a pretty good depth of field. Now, when I zoom in, I also realize little things like this, a sensor spot that's hiding right there. So these are all things that you guys need to be aware of when you're when you're kind of uh, getting your vision, like everything that you need to do, because when it comes to print, the last thing you wanna do is end up with something as simple as a sensor spot sitting in the middle of your frame and hanging on your wall. You know, your family and friends may not see that, but you're gonna, this is gonna haunt your dreams. So make sure that you guys are looking for all the little details here. You wanna make sure that maybe your subject off in the distance, the mountain here, has a little bit more sharpness to it. So we'll work on sharpening. Uh, I also like to create depth in my, my images from dark to light, sharp to soft, warm to cool tones. Those are different ways that you can kind of feed your audience's eye through a frame. So we have warm tones here, maybe some cooler tones we'll bring in here in the shadows. Uh, warmer tones out, or sorry, brighter tones out here. Maybe we'll darken it up a little bit here in the foreground as well. The other thing is I'm looking at my data here. I've shot, I shot this at 16 and a half millimeters. So whenever I have something that is very vertical, so mountains, that is sitting more so in the middle of a frame of a wide angle, that lens distortion kind of squishes it down a little bit. So I may want to come in here and maybe adjust the aspect just a little bit to beef up these mountains, make them a little bit more vertical. I'm not saying turn these into Everest by any means, but maybe bring back a little bit of their height there so you're not getting that kind of squished down feel. 
color, I want to bring in color. I'm a huge fan of color, but the thing is my images, I wanna make sure that they are representative of what I saw in nature, not what I wanted to see in nature. So, uh, you know, we'll work in some vibrance, some saturation carefully. That is something that I see quite a bit, you guys, um, where mistakes are made, people oversaturate. And when you go to print, all of a sudden these colors turn out kind of murky in a way. They, they don't really look as good as you'd like them to look. So make sure that you guys are not oversaturating your colors. And we'll talk about that here in a minute once we start getting into the sliders. The other thing that I want you guys to think about that is gonna play a huge role in how you edit and how you print is what you want the final product to be. What I mean by that is what kind of paper do you plan on printing on? Is it gonna be a high gloss? Is it gonna be a, a matte? Is it gonna be like a metallic paper? Um, what size? Where is this image going to end up? Are you gonna hang it in a room that's relatively dark? Or are you gonna hang it somewhere where you're gonna properly light it? Is it gonna be hung across from a window where it's getting direct window light? What kind of environment is this picture going to reside in if you are going to print it? That also plays a big role in your paper choice. Now, talking about paper, um, that is something that you should definitely familiarize yourself with, and that's going to help you develop your workflow in regards to editing and printing. So the best tip I can give you guys in regards to getting familiar with paper is to order a few sample prints. Order a packet of sample paper from Hanamil, who, whoever, whatever you may be using or want to use. Get those in, get them into your hands, get a feel for them, get to see what they look like in different lights, in different lights, sorry, what they feel like, the different textures of them. Um, the best thing that you could ever do for yourself is spend the money to order a sample pack of, say, one or two of your images and get that on different paper and see how your image looks in a high glass or in a rag or a metallic and, and get a feel, does that fit my style? Is that how I want my work to be displayed? And then that will carry over into your editing because you'll be able to see your images on physical prints and then maybe make the adjustments to make that print better in post. So I hope that all makes sense there. Um, if that doesn't make sense, feel free to chime in. Uh, Andre, you got a question? Yeah, so I just wanted to mention, I just posted in the chat. So from us, from Digital Silver Imaging, we have what's called a print sample promotion, um, which you can get uh, an image printed on three different papers. Most of them are fine papers from Hanamula. And maybe Veronica could chime in if you are printing at home, like where is a good place to get like sample packs of Hanamula paper and, and where to find that? Well, and and I totally agreed to look at an image on different papers because it's such a personal choice um, and we all have our unique aesthetics and perspectives. If someone's printing at home, any of the, the typical outlets that you get your Hanamula papers will have these sample packs. So I'm here in Los Angeles. So Freestyle, Sammy's, Paul's Photo, um, you know, back in Boston, there's WB Hunt and similar dealers throughout the country. Um, so there are definite, um, definite outlets for paper, B&H, Adorama, et cetera. And the yep. nice thing about sample packs, sorry, I just remembered this, is that the name of the papers on the back of the paper. So as you kind of narrow it down to your favorite range of papers, you'll have that reference with the name of the paper on the back. And that that, that is so important because I know like uh, when I started working with the group at DSI, you know, we got a sample pack and I, I thought I knew what I liked with my images. And then when I actually spread them out on the table, I was like, oh, there's some other options that look way better. Uh, so. That is just so key. Uh, and then the other thing that is key is to make sure you guys are calibrating your monitors, okay? So uh, using either Spider or Calibrite, you wanna make sure you're calibrating your, mo your monitors so your colors are coming through correctly. Uh, ideally, you know, it'd be great to have an office to where you can calibrate your monitor in the perfect environment with the windows closed, the lights off, or whatever, however you feel like editing. Uh, that unfortunately is not for me. I'm on the road so much that I calibrate um, as, as close to what I find myself in most of the time. 
But if you can really set yourself up and say, hey, this is my workspace. This is how I want to work in my environment. Calibrate your monitor, monitor in that way. That is going to be so key in making sure that uh, your colors are coming through uh, really as nicely as they should be for your prints. So calibration is key. Um, all right. I think that was everything I wanted to touch base on real fast before we start moving sliders here. So let's go ahead. I'm going to keep you guys in the bottom left here because I think you guys are kind of out of the way for the most part here in the module. So um, all right. First things first, when we edit, you guys, up in the top right and top left corners of your histogram here, we're in, we're in the uh, develop module of Lightroom Classic. You have these little triangles, and these triangles are really nice to have on. They are your clipping warnings, essentially. So your highlight clipping, and then over here on the left-hand side, if I hover over that, they'll tell you guys that is your shadow clipping. So by turning those both on and off, those will kind of give you guidelines of way, when you're maybe pushing your highlights and your whites too much or your blacks and your shadows too much. And you're starting to get to a point where maybe uh, there is no, no data or texture there. That's, you know, your highlights are just going to be pure white or your shadows and blacks are going to be just pure black. So you want to try to uh, avoid that. You know, there are certain circumstances, maybe in black and white photography, where you really want to kind of create that that harsh contrast, but for color, you know, I'm usually very wary of pushing my tones that much. And if you don't know what that looks like, and if you go too far, if we take our whites way up here, you can see that the areas of red are those are our clipping warnings that's saying, hey, Mike, you've gone a little too crazy here with that slider. So back it off a little bit. And the blacks, all of a sudden, they start warning you with a color of blue, and that says, hey. You may want to back it off a little bit here because you really don't have anything besides the color black or white right there. So I always have those on just in case I get a little heavy handed at times. Over the years, I've been able to kind of not do that, but it's just good there to have as a little bit of a heads up. As we come down in our panel here, uh, first thing we're running to is where it says profile, Adobe color. Now, if you click on Adobe color, it's going to give you a drop down. It says Adobe landscape, portrait, standard, vivid, camera, flat, so on. If you hover over to the right hand side, you have this kind of quadrant of four rectangles. If you click on this, it's going to give you more options that are going to drop you down to where you have camera matching profiles. So I shoot on the Nikon Z8. So these are the profiles that are associated with the Nikon Z8 in regards to a flat profile, a landscape profile, neutral, so on. Well, what does this mean? Well, without going too, too sciencey here, basically it's a way for you to essentially match the color for what you saw out in the field and kind of get a, a head start on your, your edit. And if we go back here, let's get off the list view here. So if we go back to, da, 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 let's close it out, sorry there. Just the basics here, Adobe Color, Adobe Landscape. I like to just kind of work in Adobe Landscape when I'm working on a landscape photo. If I'm working on a portrait, I like working on Adobe Portrait. Uh, it's like they've done their research into the names, right? They kind of know what these color profiles are associated with. And what I like is I feel like Adobe Landscape for me when I'm working in my landscape photos kind of gives me a little jump start uh, in regards to saturation and some shadow and highlight recovery. And sometimes when you click on it, you can actually see a small change in the histogram, which I feel like it gives you a little bit more dynamic range to work with at times. So if I click on Adobe Landscape, you can see, we'll go back and forth here. You can see a little bit more blue come into the scene. You can also see a little bit more recovery in the highlights. Sometimes it's pretty dramatic and it can actually kind of save you if you have highlights that are very close to being clipped. Um, and if you haven't seen the difference here, I know it's like going to the optometrist, you know, you're sitting here and going A or B, A or B, which one looks better. Uh, practice in your own Lightroom by switching back and forth between the color profiles to see which one kind of matches what you saw out in the field or what you're trying to create. Now, this shot was taken back here in uh, February of this year. And one thing that I always try to do when I'm trying to edit uh, is match the scene as perfectly as I can. And I've slept since February, believe it or not, I, I've, I've barely slept, but I've slept since February. So to recall exactly what this morning looked like is quite difficult. So whenever I'm out, uh, I always take a quick video on my phone. Uh, of the scene that I'm shooting. That helps me kind of reflect back on what it looked like. So that helps me kind of match 
more truly uh, what the scene was rather than maybe getting a little too far away from myself and saying, well, this is what I wanted it to look like. And that's just kind of my ethics there. But all right, first things first, switching the profile from Adobe Color to Adobe Landscape. Now, we have our white balance sliders, our temperature and our tint. I'm gonna skip right over that. What I do is I come down here and I work in uh, my exposure, contrast, highlight shadows, blacks, and whites. And then I go down to my midtone contrast and my vibrance and saturation. And then I come back and I adjust my white balance at the end there. And the reason being is because as I add in contrast, as I add in vibrance and saturation, that's all going to mess with the white balance. So I like to do that first and then go back and correct the white balance to where I'd like it to be. And that's just my method. You know, there's so many different photographers out there that have different workflows, but that's what I have liked to do over the years. Also, you guys will see there's a contrast slider and then you have your highlights, shadows, whites, and black sliders here. Just because a slider exists in Lightroom or an Adobe Camera Raw doesn't mean you necessarily need to use it. So one of the mistakes I see is a lot of people feel like they need to use every single slider that is part of a program, and that's not necessarily true. And also these sliders, they go to plus 100 or minus 100. Just because they go that far in that range doesn't mean you need to utilize or be that aggressive with those sliders. So a lot of the edits I do tend to be maybe a little bit more conservative in regards to how much I push that slider positive or negative. The thing you need to be careful of in Lightroom is that it is for the most part a global editing program. So if you're going to adjust your shadows, it's going to adjust them everywhere within the image. So if you're looking to adjust shadows in a very specific area, then you can come up and you can use these masking options here in the top right corner to make more localized adjustments. Or you can go into Photoshop and do, you know, luminosity masking, which is a little bit more advanced technique, or just use masking tools within Photoshop to come in and essentially hand paint in or out certain areas. So Lightroom has come a long way, but it also has its limitations still. So just please remember when you guys are working in Lightroom, the majority of these edits are going to be global edits. So, all right, let's hop into the edit here. So what do I see? The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to brighten up my image here, probably about half a stop. And just because I do one thing doesn't mean that's how that image is going to stay when I get to the final edit. So I'm gonna brighten it up at half a stop so I can kind of see what I'm working with here. I'm gonna skip over the contrast slider. And the reason I'm gonna skip over it is because with Lightroom being global, this is going to add to your shadows and your highlights, your blacks and your whites equally. I would much rather create my contrast by utilizing the highlight shadows, whites and black sliders down here. So I'm gonna come up to my highlights. I'm gonna bring it all the way up and bring it all the way down. I'm gonna see what area of the image is being affected by simply my highlights. And I see that if I bring it up, it really washes out my sky. If I start bringing it down, it's starting to kind of bring back in some of the detail, the beautiful clouds back here. So in this case, I'm gonna bring down the highlights, maybe minus 60 or so right here. And once again, just to remind you guys, as we go through these sliders, just because you move them and you move on to the next one, doesn't mean you're done with that slider. There's a lot of back and forth and back and forth here. And I wish we had a three hour session. I could walk you through how detail oriented I am with all of this, but we'll keep this uh, the speed dating style right now. So highlights are gonna come down to kind of help show some of the detail in the sky. Shadows I'm gonna pull down and bring up. And as I bring them down, you guys can see I start introducing some contrast into the scene. So I kind of like what that's doing for the foreground here and also in the mountains. So I'm gonna pull that down just a little bit here. Whites all the way up. And you can see how the whites, if we get too aggressive, we start clipping the highlights. So obviously that is not what we want. If I bring them down, you can see how it kind of starts to reveal a little bit more detail like the highlights were in the sky there. So maybe, maybe I'll bring them down just a smidge, right about minus 15 here. And what that's doing is just trying to bring in some more definition in the sky here, but I don't want to completely wash out the whites and the highlights because they are important in creating that texture up there. Blacks all the way up, you can see how that really softens up the scene. Blacks all the way down, really crunches the scene. And what I hope you guys are seeing as we're moving the sliders around is as we add or reduce contrast in the image, that plays a role in how much or how little saturation is in the image as well. So if you add contrast, you add saturation. So be careful 
when you do your edits to not accidentally adjust too much contrast in a way to where you're making the saturation oversaturated, which can result in a kind of a, a, a negative for your print. Uh, so you always wanna make sure that when you add contrast or subtract contrast, you come down to your saturation and you adjust accordingly if you feel like it's added too much or too little. Presence, AKA midtone contrast. This is a big one. This is something where I see a lot of people make um, mistakes in regards to not only edits, but also prints. Okay, midtone contrast. Basically, you have highlights and shadows pushed up closely together. When you add midtone contrast, it adds contrast to that region. Uh, a lot of people think that it's sharpening. It's not really sharpening. It may give the effect that it's sharpening, but it's it's not sharpening. So what they like to do is they take clarity and they just crank it all the way up and say, ah, look how great that is. All the details are out. Well, you can see that that really grunges up the photo. It also kind of washes out the colors. And in some instances, you got to be really careful because when you have areas where you have highlights and shadows pushed up uh, quite strongly together, you may introduce something called haloing or ghosting. And that is, if you look at the edge of a mountain, you may see this kind of whitewash area floating right above the mountain. And that is because you've overdone your midtone contrast. And that has uh, now affected that area in a way to where you have this kind of whitewash kind of ghosting look. And, that will print. So that's the last thing you want to see. So make sure when you guys are working with texture clarity dehaze that you are using them in a way to where they're getting the job done, but they're not introducing any artifacts. Now, when do you use these and why do you use them? Well, once again, they, they've done some research. So that read the names. Okay. Dehaze. Uh, this is best used when you have some sort of haze, some sort of light pollution, some or not pollution, some sort of pollution, or maybe fog. Uh, it's really aggressive, so it does cut through that. But let's go ahead and bring it up here. And you can immediately see the negative 2D haze. Uh, it goes and it murks up your colors quite dramatically. So you can see plus 53, back to zero. Look at the difference in the colors right there. So D haze, you have to be very careful on to not use too much, and it's going to mark up your colors that way. It also will add a little bit more grain to your image. Now, we'll skip clarity for a second here, and we'll go to texture. If I bring up the texture here, you can see that it's kind of affecting the foreground area, the sand and the snow, as well as a little bit of the mountains back there. Uh, it's not really doing much for the mountains back there, but it is doing more for the texture that is close in the frame. So what I like to kind of reference with texture is if you have texture that is up close and personal in your face, like we do here, maybe that is the mid-tone contrast that's gonna work best for that area. If you have some sort of pollution or fog, then dehaze might work best as your mid-tone contrast. Um, if you don't have either and you just want to add a little bit of midtone contrast, that's when our friend the Clarity slider comes into play and you can go ahead and just add a little bit of that into the frame to kind of tighten up those midtone areas and to bring out a little bit more definition. So play around these if you're not familiar with them, um, but I highly recommend not using all three at the same time. Rarely do I ever use two at the same time. Uh, for this image here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the texture slider because I have quite a bit of texture in my foreground, and I'm just going to bring it up until we bring out just a smidge more of that texture that's in the sand and the the snow slash slush that's kind of cut caught up there on the ripples of the sand. So that's something to kind of think in my, think in your head when you guys are using these sliders. Which one do you want to use? Um, use them with intent. Don't just move them all around because they make the image look good. Use them for with intent and also pay really close attention to your horizons or your edges because you can definitely overdo it with these and introduce some of that ghosting slash haloing. Vibrance and saturation, you guys, uh, this is obviously where you can pump in some color. Vibrance, if you're not familiar with what that is, vibrance is essentially reading the image and it's saying which colors have quite a bit of saturation to them and which colors don't have saturation to them. And it adds saturation to the colors that lack saturation. Saturation adds saturation to every color equally, whether it's extremely oversaturated or maybe undersaturated. So 
I tend to use vibrance uh, more than I use saturation. So in this image here, I'm going to bring the vibrance all the way up. I'm going to see what it does for the image. Obviously, it makes it look really bad. Uh, so I'm going to bring the vibrance up just a smidge here, and that's going to help pump in some color to the sky here, also to the blues in the snow here. And then maybe we'll come down to the saturation. We'll bring it all the way up, see what it does. And in this image here, probably not going to add much saturation at all to it because the vibrance seems to be getting the job done. I just want to pump up the colors a little bit in the sky. And that gets the job done here with about a plus 18. Backslash is one of your best slash favorite keys to use in Lightroom. You can toggle back and forth to where the camera or where the image was straight out of the camera and where you're at now. And this is something I'm always clicking because I like to kind of keep a reference on how much of it I've edited and where I'm at in regards to make, making sure I'm not over editing the image. So we've gone through, we've made some, some basic adjustments here in our basic panel. Now I'm gonna come back up to our white balance. And this is where I'm gonna say, all right, let's get this image looking the way I want it to look in regards to overall color. So this is feeling a little too blue. Now it is the Arctic, it is very cold. So I do like my Arctic scenes to feel a little bit more on the cool end, but we do have this beautiful sunrise light coming in that is bringing in those warm tones. So I'm gonna bring in a little bit of warmth. And then you can see how as I bring in that warmth, it's starting to pull out more of the magentas in the, uh, the snow and the shadow regions. Maybe I'll kind of pull those magentas down just a smidge here to kind of bring it back towards a little bit of that cooler tonality backslash we're right here. And I'm always trying to think about where I am in regards to light. And what I mean by that is how is the light working in this scene? Snow is white, ice is white. It's very reflective. So in a way, that snow that is in the sand should have some of those same tones and colors that are in the sky because it's reflecting it, right? I always laugh when people want to have my white sands workshops and people are like, oh, I really hope we get a beautiful pink fiery sunset tonight. And I'm like, careful what you wish for, because all of a sudden now you have red sands national park instead of white sands national park, because that white sand is reflecting all that beautiful sunrise or sunset color. So the same thing is applicable when you're shooting in snow, making sure that your snow or your ice is reflecting the colors that uh, are in the sky here. So this right here, a small adjustment into the warmth for my temperature and a small adjustment of a little bit of green in the tint gets me to a point where I'm, I'm okay with it, I'm happy with it. And something to kind of keep in mind, you guys, I know this is a, a shorter session, but you know these, these edits are not just one and done. I go back you know, within a few hours time and kind of refine the edits and make sure, hey, I'm getting exactly what I want. It's not just move the sliders once and call, call it done. So this is always gonna be a little bit back and forth kind of ping pong per se when I'm editing. Now, I'm also looking at the edits I've made and going, all right, well, now I want to pull down the exposure. I brought it up about half a stop. Now I'm gonna pull it back down to a little bit more about a quarter stop than what, uh, brighter than what I shot. And that's going to kind of bring me back into what that scene was at that moment right there, a little bit darker. It's not going to be super bright. The light hasn't really spilled into that area yet. So that is kind of how I've made my few basic adjustments based off of my vision there. Now, something to kind of keep in mind when you guys are editing is that your histogram is going to move up here. OK, so make sure you're kind of watching that histogram. And if you go darker, that histogram is going to push to the left. You go brighter, it's going to move to the right. So just kind of keep that in mind in regards to not um, over or under processing the image. Kind of keep that histogram uh, more so in the middle, unless it's a super contrasty image, then it's going to have kind of a, a U shape to it where your shadows and your blacks are going to be more pushed to the left and your highlights and your whites can be more pushed to the right. So studying your histogram and your camera and also in post is going to be so, so key. Um, center spots, these little evil guys out here, if you guys aren't familiar with those, uh, go to F22, go take a picture of the sky and you'll quickly realize your camera most likely has some center spots in there unless it's nice and new or, and clean. Uh, these guys are very easy to remove in post and you definitely want to do them for any sort of print and you want to do them for web too. You just want to have your image, you know, looking as good as possible. So in Lightroom, you have the spot healing brush 
which is a little Band-Aid over here. If you click on that guy right there, you can then hover over that spot using your left and right brackets on your keyboard to make that brush bigger or smaller. And I wanna make sure that the feather for this brush is set to zero, so we have a nice soft feather. And then I can simply bring the brush right over it, paint a little bit, and sometimes it does a wonderful job. Sometimes it does this kind of job right here where you can see it didn't really uh, heal it properly, right? So this tool right here is probably 90% worthy in, in Lightroom. It gets the job done most of the time. But when I'm doing my my spot healing, I like to do it in Photoshop. I feel like it does a better job and I have more control to kind of sample the areas that I want to uh, clone over or clone out. So also here, you've got the uh, spot healing brush. And if you come down to the Band-Aid right there, this is your healing option. And then to the right, this is your cloning option. So these are two different ways for you to essentially try to get rid of the spot if you are dead set on um, getting rid of this in Lightroom and not Photoshop. And when you paint over it, you can actually see it's telling you where it's sampling from. And you can move that area around to an area of maybe similar texture and color to try and kind of cover it up. So maybe something like this right here. And that still doesn't do what I wanted to do. So I would say this spot I'm going to remove in Photoshop. But I wanted to show you guys, if you are just Lightroom only, that you can use this healing brush here uh, to get rid of the majority of your sensor spots that you may have or dust. Or in my case, I have a dog. So dog hair seems to find its way all the time on my camera lens or in my camera. So that's that. Let's come on down to a few of the panels that I wanted to show you guys that are going to translate over into print quality. So when you come down to detail, all right, if you are set to Lightroom only, uh, you are going to want to sharpen your image and add just a little bit of sharpening. You know, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is over sharpening your image. And that's going to make these really kind of hard edge lines, especially with mountains or trees um, and they're just not going to be looking great. So over sharpening is very easy. Um, it's something that we are all guilty of. Uh, I look back on my work from 10 years ago and I cringe at times. So if you are in the detail panel for Lightroom and you want to sharpen, by default, I believe it gives you these settings right here. The amount, radius, detail, that's all I believe exactly what, um, what it is for defaults. Now, I, I'm not gonna lie, I do most of my sharpening in Photoshop through uh, a high pass filter, and then I go in and I mask out the areas that I want to be sharp, or I mask in the areas I wanna be sharp, and mask out the areas I don't wanna be sharp. If you're for Lightroom, and that is where you wanna stay in, uh, they do have this masking slider, which a lot of people don't realize is a thing. So when you sharpen, okay, it's good to sharpen, and it is important to sharpen, but don't over sharpen. And the way you learn what is too much and what is too little is by doing sample proofs, okay? So by saying, okay, maybe on this image here, I'm gonna have the amount at 40. And then on this one, I'm gonna have the amount at 90. And then you print them both off and you see what the difference may be. Um, but this masking slider, let's talk about that because that is a beautiful little tool within Lightroom. Let's say, and this is usually how I think anyways, but let's say we want the mountains in the foreground to be nice and sharp, but we want the clouds to be soft, which is usually the case. Same with water. I want water to usually be nice and soft and I want the foreground or the landscape around to have a little bit more sharpness to it. Well, if you come down to this masking slider here and on a Mac, if you hold down option, which is alt on a PC and you left click and you hold, your whole screen goes white. What that is saying is that everywhere that is white on your screen is receiving the sharpening. So once again, global, 100% of your image right now is being sharpened. As you start to slide to the right, you can see how we're removing the sharpening from the sky 
And it's just maintaining the sharpening on some of the hardest edges of the mountains and some of those harder edges of the snow slash the ripples in the sand. Some of the clouds that are up there in the top right corner are also getting a little sharp, sharpening applied to them. And that's okay to have some of those harder edges of the clouds, but those soft silky clouds, you really don't wanna have sharpened. So what I like to do is find an area, so maybe somewhere right about here, and I let go. And what does that do? Well, that has now sharpened the edges of the mountain, some of the foreground, but it has left the majority of the sky unsharpened. So where it's nice and soft and has that kind of silky look to it. So when you guys are sharpening, make sure you're sharpening in a manner that is with intent. So if you have a soft sky, keep that sky nice and soft. If you have something that has a lot of detail in your foreground, make sure that that's receiving a little bit of sharpening. But take some time to practice on what is too much sharpening and what is not enough sharpening. Um, that is something that you know the guys at DSI and I were talking about is I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is over sharpening. Now, the other mistake that a lot of people make when it comes to prints, and this is such an easy fix, is removing chromatic aberration. So chromatic aberration is essentially an artifact. Uh, from my understanding, it is the light hitting the camera sensor, sensor nanoseconds apart and creating this kind of fringing look to harder edges, especially edges that are where highlights and shadows are meeting up. And you get this kind of red or purple or green fridging edge that goes around the, uh, the subject. If you put your image on the web, most likely you're never gonna see it. If you put an image on print at 40 by 60 or 20 by 30, and you hang it up, you're gonna see that chromatic aberration. And that's, the, that's, that's probably second worst to seeing a sensor spot smack dab in the middle of your, your photo. So you don't want it. So, Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw, both under their lens correction panels, have a remove chromatic aberration checkbox. And when you click on that checkbox, 98% of the time, let's call it, any chromatic aberration that is in the image is taken out. Um, this is something that whether I see chromatic aberration in the frame or I don't, I always click it because there's never a time in my career that I've been like, I really wish this image had more chromatic aberration to it. So I always click it just to kind of make sure it covers my butt in case there's any chromatic aberration hidden within the image and I want that to be taken out. Um, enable profile corrections is another uh, checkbox that you can kind of toy around with here. Uh, when I check this off and check it on, you guys can see the corners of my frames. Uh, there's a little bit of a vignette that is taken away and you can see a little bit of perspective correction where the mountains are gonna be warped out. So, you know, this, this little checkbox right here is something that you can play around with. Sometimes I keep it to where I don't enable any of the profile corrections because I like the natural vignette of the lens. And then sometimes I do check it because I want that vignette to be gone. I don't want my corners to be dark. So play around with the enable profile corrections here. That will sometimes uh, make or break an image uh, in regards to the vignette that you have. And how does that transpire over to prints? Well, when we're sitting here editing, we're usually pretty darn close to the monitor. So it's very easy at times to kind of overlook a vignette. But you print something out 20 by 30 and you step eight feet away from it, all of a sudden that vignette may become a little bit more apparent. So make sure you guys are watching the corners of your frames uh, for any sort of vignette that you may or may not want in your image there. How are we doing on questions? Anything? I know I feel like I'm just kind of chatting away here. Is there any any questions that have come up? Well, I think I'm answering a lot of them in the chat and in the Q and A. And there's some I think we can save. Uh, well, let me ask you a couple of questions here, Mike. Okay. We're also running a little long, so okay. we're, you know we're at uh, twelve fifty, oh eleven fifty, oh one fifty four, depending on what time. <laughs> Wherever you're at. Yeah, fifty four. Okay. Um, uh, so. There's a question from Scott um, who says, I have Lightroom question. I've been wondering about uh, the develop module. There are five presets, Adobe Color, Landscape, Portrait, Standard, and yeah. Vivid. And I think you've talked about them. And uh, one of these must be selected when uh, ingesting images and converting to DNG. I'm wondering if you could address how these presets impact an image when ingesting. 
I do a lot of photographing of artwork and visual artists. So the question really is which preset um, is the most true or accurate color? It seems to clearly be the choice of Adobe color or Adobe standard, but I'm confused. Yeah, that and that is all coming down to the eye of the beholder in a way, right? Because it's basically allowing you to match the colors to uh, what you saw. So uh, for me, I tend to work more so in the Adobe landscape color space. Uh, when I'm shooting, and you can also do this in your camera. So you can go and set up color profiles in your camera. So when I'm shooting on my Z8, I'm shooting it in Adobe Flat, or not Adobe Flat, sorry. It's uh, Nikon's uh, Flat Profile because I don't want it to add any, any saturation or any contrast for me in the camera. I'll do that in post. I wanna see basically as raw data as I can get. Sure, it looks, it looks very flat when you're out in the field, but um, I want it to not come pre-baked, right? So I want it to have the raw data and I wanna be able to edit that data on my own in post. So when you are, shooting in the field, I, I recommend like a, a normal or a flat color profile. Um, when you're ingesting, that's when you can say, okay, which one of these profiles tends to match what I was shooting? And for me, it's the Adobe landscape that tends to match uh, the scenes more so than the Adobe color or the Adobe portrait. Like if I switch back over to Adobe color, you can see the shift in the colors here. So I find that the Adobe Color is a little bit more flat and unsaturated. The Adobe Landscapes gets me a little bit more saturation, a little bit more contrast, and this is more what I saw. So it's kind of, like I said, in the eye of the beholder on what profile you want to choose. What I'd recommend doing, though, is maybe uh, importing it as Adobe Color, and then you can still, in your profile here, change and see which one works best, and then say, okay, you know what, I really like how Adobe Portrait is working for all these images. So I'm gonna import these images all as Adobe Portrait in the future. Yeah, and so. I, I would just wanna chime in there too for you, Scott, is if you're doing artwork, definitely use Adobe Color. And I would also recommend that if you have the option, then do the fine tuning in Photoshop because it's a, it's a much more precise tool, which kind of gets to a lot of questions. People have been asking about the sliders and say, where is this slider and where is that slider? And what I've been answering in the chat is that Adobe Lightroom is designed to be a very streamlined editing tool. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Mike, but it's designed for speed um, and to kind of get your edits done quickly and efficiently as opposed to uh, Photoshop, which has a, a ton of adjustment. Yeah, so Photoshop is kind of edit one photo at a time per se, right? Lightroom is great for kind of batch processing. So like, you know, when I shoot, when I used to shoot weddings or NHL games, like I could just whip through images real fast, edit one, copy the settings, paste it to the rest, export, and I'm on my way. Uh, Photoshop's where you're really coming in and refining the details very precisely one image at a time. So um, the one thing kind of to bounce off that, that I wanted to just remind people is you have all these different panels over here. You have your basic tone curve all the way down to effects and calibration. Um, and a lot of people tend to get into the workflow mindset that they start with white balance and then when they get down to calibration, their image is done. Please don't make that mistake. When you go through these panels, take a second. So like you get through them all and you get down to the bottom, take a second, walk away, come back an hour later, a day later, look at your image, then go back and refine the colors and the contrast because I guarantee you, we all get tunnel vision. And the worst mistake you can make is to run through all these panels and then just say, okay, I'm done. And then you look at the image five days later and you're like, wow, there's a lot I could have done differently. So take your time with your edits, okay? Uh, something else too that kind of popped in my head when I just uh, uh, looked at my, my module here. A lot of people also make the mistake of saying, hey, I need to come in and I need to look at 500% to make sure my image is super sharp. 100% uh, is where you really want to be looking at the overall sharpness of your image. Uh, you know, so don't don't get too crazy and say, well, 200%, it looks, it looks a little fuzzy there. It, it's probably a good thing that it looks a little fuzzy at 200%. You want to really make sure that the majority of your, your work is being done at 100%. And you're not going to drive yourself crazy by zooming in 200, 400 percent. 
to make sure everything looks perfect there. 100%, if it looks sharp and it looks, um, looks good there, then you're usually good to go. So just another, I'm gonna, we're gonna do another couple of quick questions yeah. and then we're gonna move on to Photoshop quickly here. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I also wanna say about sharpening because as printers, that's the biggest mistake, like you said, that we see. And, and I guess my advice would be um, on your monitor, Mike and I were talking earlier about the webinar. So, you know, we both have 27 inch monitors that we work on, but if you're working off a laptop, um, and you're going to make a, a you know 24 by 36 inch print even on my monitor which is 27 inches make sure that you do look at it at 100 percent and if you're working on a on a, a laptop it's even more important but also when it comes to sharpening i would sharpen to where it looks sharp to your eye on the monitor and then maybe back it off a little bit because yeah. if anything, it's going to look sharper in print because you're going to be standing away from the image. You're not going to be right up on it, you know, like we look at our monitors. And if you over sharpen, you're going to get all kinds of bad things happening. Jaggies, chromatic aberration, all that stuff. Yeah. And then you mentioned, you mentioned, hey, you know, looking at it uh, 30 by 40 or whatever. Something, too, uh, is that the beauty about, uh, you know, printing is not everything needs to maintain the two by three aspect ratio, right? So, you know, most of these cameras, you know, we're putting out two by three or four by three, um, you know, coming into Photoshop, Adobe Camera Raw, Lightroom, you know, coming into your crop tool and saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to switch it from the original aspect ratio two by three and go to a one by one. Let me reframe this photo real fast. All of a sudden, you now have a one by one uh, picture that works great. Uh, so take a look around your house, you know. Most prints that uh, actually sell that are really big prints are not two by three. They're 16 by nine or they're one by one because there's all these awkward spaces and houses that maybe a two by three print is not going to work the best, but a one by one may work really well on a small wall in the kitchen or above a couch. A 16 by nine is going to look better than a two by three. So don't be afraid to crop your, your images into different aspect ratios as well because, you know, you guys have the ability over there to print all these different sizes and aspect ratios. It doesn't just need to come out in a two by three. Yeah. And I just want to throw in, I have one, there's one more question that popped up in the Q and a from Richard about yeah. using high pass sharpening as well. Um, but he's confused at how many pixels might be too many to sharp. Uh, I guess Mike, Mike and Mike, uh, tell me if you concur with this, if you yeah. have some kind of setting where you're sharpening in the camera, um, I would take that off, um, turn it off. And I would, you know, sharpen only in your post-production uh, procedure because you can't go backwards. If you over sharpen yeah. in the camera, then you're you're stuck with an over sharpened image. So uh, I would turn it off. Yeah, I agree with that. I'd have the the sharpening turned off. And the other thing is to be careful when you guys are exporting. Uh, so if you're exporting from Lightroom, a uh, common mistake that people will make is they'll come in and they'll go to their detail panel. They'll add in sharpening. They'll mask out whatever it is they don't want sharpened. When they come to um, exporting, so let's go ahead and get off, whoops. Let's get off of this real fast here. So if we were to uh, export this image here, make sure when you guys get to this export panel here, then you scroll down where it says output sharpening, sharpen four. You wanna unclick that because what you're doing right there is you're essentially double sharpening the image. So you may not realize it, but when all is said and done, that image is going to come out with additional sharpening on it, which therefore may end up with artifacts or banding being created in the printing process. So make sure that your, your sharpening is turned off in the camera internally. If you don't know how to do that, there's a lot of YouTube videos. Just Google your camera and sharpening. You could turn it off that way. And then if you're going to add sharpening here in Lightroom, when you export it, you're not going to add additional sharpening. Or if I'm gonna edit this image in Photoshop, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take the sharpening and I'm gonna turn the sharpening to zero in Lightroom and then add my sharpening in Photoshop. That way I'm not sharpening in Lightroom and also sharpening in Photoshop. Um, any other questions that have popped up? Um, I, think, I think that we're gonna save the rest of these for the end. Cool. Okay, so um, let's go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop this over real fast to Photoshop because I want to show you guys something else that I've seen 
um, in regards to editing, where, let me move you guys out of the way here. There we go. Where I've seen people uh, make some mistakes and that it comes into uh, dodging and burning. Okay, so when you guys are dodging and burning, uh, Photoshop has the good old dodge and burn tool, which I think needs to just go away. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tool that uh, I'm not a fan of, and I highly recommend you guys not use the dodge and burn tool within uh, good old Photoshop here. Um, the reason being is it is, you know, black and white, right? And if you look at the colors that are in the snow right here, that's not white. So when you dodge, and if you're dodging with the dodge and burn tool, it's going to make this kind of murky white or murky gray. And that's not obviously going to bode well when you print. It's not going to look good. The colors aren't going to match. So dodging and burning, I want to show you guys quickly how I set up for that. So you guys can start dodging and burning in a color that makes sense. And therefore, it's going to look better when you print it. So if you're not familiar with dodging and burning, dodging is brightening an area. Burning is going to be darkening an area. Uh, the way I do my dodging and burning is I come up and I go to layer, new layer, and we'll just call this dodge. And what I like to do is change the blend mode from normal down to either overlay or soft light. Sometimes I'll play it around with either one of them and see which one I like better. For this, we'll do soft light. We're going to hit OK. So now we've created a layer above our actual pixel layer. And we are going to hit I for eyedropper. That's the quick key. And say like I want to work on burn or dodging some of the kind of lighter tones within the snow here. I'm going to sample that color. And I usually sample kind of the brighter area of that color. So something like this. And as you guys can see, the color that's being sampled is very far from white. So we're going to sample that color in our toolbar on the left hand side. You have your foreground color which is going to be the color that you just sampled. If you click on that, you can then take that color, drag it up, and maybe a little bit towards the left, towards white. So we're essentially desaturating the color and brightening it. Hit OK. Hit B for brush. And at the top here, where our opacity is for the brush, we and pull that on down, maybe about 10%. And then with intent, you come through and you can start to hit different areas where that light is maybe skimming across the top of the snow here or whatever it is you want to dodge. And when you're dodging, I have a general rule is you should not be able to see anything changing as you're doing it. But when you toggle that layer on and off, you should be able to see some sort of change taking place. So what I do here is I go ahead and I dodge the areas where I'm saying, hey, you know what? I want to create a little bit of dimension. I want to create a little bit of pop. When I turn this layer on and off, you can then see how that snow has a little bit more pop, a little bit more life to it. But as I'm doing it, I'm not really noticing that it's happening. So when you dodge, you want to dodge with color and you want to dodge in a very uh, generous, or not generous, but a very conservative kind of way. And that is going to help your image have dimension, depth, contrast built into it, but in a way where all the colors make sense. So when you print it, you're not going to see these kind of blobs of brighter areas that are hidden within. You're going to see the colors match, the tones match, and it's going to look all in one and natural. So um, just wanted to show you guys that real quick here. And if you are sharpening in Photoshop, the way that I sharpen in Photoshop here is when all is said and done, say like I've made any sort of adjustments, dodging and burning adjustments or hue and saturation adjustment layers, anything that I want to do in Photoshop, my very last step is to sharpen the image. So the way I would do that is I would make a merged visible layer. And I'm, I apologize if this gets a little too technical, but I'll walk you guys through it as carefully as I can. Merge visible layer, you hold down Command, Option, Shift, E as an Edward, or if you're on a PC, Control, Alt, Shift, E, all at once. And what you can see now is we have this new layer one. So basically, it's a pixel layer that has combined all the layers below it, but without actually flattening all your layers. So 
Uh, if you mess up, you're not having to go back and undo a bunch of different things. You just delete this layer. So this layer one is now going to be how I sharpen. And I'll even rename it for you guys real quick here. So we'll double click on it. We'll call it sharpen. If I come up to with that pixel layer selected, if I come up to filter, other, high pass, I keep the radius generally set at 1.0 and I hit OK. Now it looks like we have a beautiful gray screen, but if you zoom in, you could actually start seeing some of the edges of the sharper areas or of the more defined areas. So you can see a fence post out here, some of the mountain out here. Those are being selected. And when we go ahead and change the blend mode from normal, and I like to come down to vivid light, we get our pixel layer back. And if we zoom in and we turn this on and off, you can see the sharpening. It might be kind of hard to zoom, but you can see the sharpening that has taken place to just the most refined edges. And that is how I like to actually sharpen. And you know, sometimes I'll go ahead and from here, I'll bring the opacity down a little bit if I feel like it's too sharp or too much for this image. Or sometimes what I like to do is maybe add a mask to that actual sharpened layer. And then it's a white mask. So with a black brush, I may come in and mask out you know, certain areas of the sky or different parts of the mountain or so on. So it's not usually just a do the sharpening, change the blend mode from normal to vivid light, call it a day. Sometimes I may come in here and actually refine the mask uh, for the sharpening to very, very specific areas. But that's just me. That's just how I like to sharpen. There's so many different ways to do it. So many different photographers have different opinions on what different blend modes or what kind of filters to use. That's just my workflow. You know, we all have our different workflows, so that's mine. But uh, I wanted to show you guys that real quick as well in here. So um, anything else you guys wanted to talk about? Has anybody popped in with anything that any any other questions? I'm jumping in here. Um, Andrea is uh, having a little techno problem. Um, can hear us, but ah. can't see the screen. Um, you, I'm just trying to see here. Um, he can I'm always communicate to... with the Navy SEAL signs, all right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the recent questions is from an old friend of ours, Bruce Hamilton. Can you discuss sharpening with high pass filter in Photoshop? Did we already cover that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. That's okay. uh, let's see if there's any else. Um, hold on. Sorry, folks. You good? You know, something, Eric, real quick, I could chime in on too is you know we didn't we didn't touch base in in, in Lightroom on it, but you have the option to soft proof in Lightroom. Um, I personally have trust issues with soft proofing. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure what your guys' thoughts are on it too, but uh it, it really is isn't the greatest thing uh my best suggestion if you want to see what your prints look like versus what your computer is showing you is to get sample pick, uh, proofs edit an image take note on maybe how you edited it you know did you calibrate your monitor prior did you not calibrate um do you know do a few sample prints on different papers get it back and then go, you know what? Okay, these are printing way brighter than what my computer is showing or way darker than what my computer is showing and make your adjustments from there. Um, just, I haven't had much luck with soft proofing in the past. Totally agree. I'm back, so. Oh, he's back. <laughs> so. <laughs> and Veronica just mentioned a question um, from Jeff. Sabo, hopefully I got the name pronounced right, which I'm looking for in the in the questions, Veronica. Was it in a question or was it in the chat? Uh, it was, it was, uh, hold on here. It was about uh, something to do with the mountain area in that image. Let me look, let me look. Maybe well, it was I, in... I want to answer a question that oh. somebody posted in the chat while you're looking for that, uh, Veronica. Okay. So somebody asked about, um, external filters you know like mm -hmm. specifically about the nick filters and from my personal opinion i think the nick filters are really good um, especially their silver effects filter it works really well with our black and white 
our DSI silver gelatin, our DSI digital um, fiber paper works great with that. And I think that also their sharpening filter is is very good as well. Yeah, you know, I, I it's been a hot minute since I've used Nick, um, but I remember a lot of their black and white filters are really nice. Um, you know, you, you still, the thing with filters and presets in general is that, you know, make them yours. You know, it's not just a one and done. A lot of people think, oh, I just press it and it's done. You know, there are sliders to be adjusted. Um, so don't just trust that you're using a preset and that's that's that. You still need to make your adjustments and still need to make that image yours. Um, yeah, Eric, Veronica. there's a very technical question in the chat about rips. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you yep. want to answer that one. Yeah, so um, I think there was a question about the image print rip, which we are um, starting to work with. We have generally worked through some of the Canon software and printing um, printing through that. I do know you can. I know that some people have been very happy with uh, the various rips from image print. Um, but um, I can't answer them I, overly technically right now. Um, yeah. um, I, I would say if, you're, if your rip sharpens and you're sharpening in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom, either do one or the other, not both. And for Betsy just asked, rip stands for a raster image processor. So it does give you some more fine tune controlling um, instead of just printing through the printer driver. Yeah, um, so um, I think probably aren't working with a rip. And so, and something I, I think you know, Eric, you mentioned somebody mentioning the mountains, or I, I, I think maybe Veronica mentioned it. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier at the beginning, like, hey, correcting the perspective of the mountains. Um, I wanted to show real fast how I would do that, and something to be careful of in regards to how that could be a negative for printing. So mm -hmm. these mountains here, they're shot in the middle of a 16 and a half millimeter frame. So they get a little bit of that kind of squishiness to them, right? Because of the, the lens distortion. So uh, to keep this pretty cut and dry, what I do in Photoshop here is I would hit M for marquee. I would select just below the mountains here, like so. And what I would do from here is I would come up to edit, transform, and you can do this a couple different ways. You can use the warp tool, you can use distort. Uh, but if you grab distort, you can then just simply drag up, okay? And that stretches that part of the frame up, right? So like I said, don't, don't make these Everest, okay? These mountains are not that. So what I'm looking for here is to simply bring the mountains up just a smidge. So just a little bit like this right here. And that kind of gets them back to what they really kind of looked like from where I was at. Now. If you've been on Instagram lately, if for some reason it's a trend of people doing where they make the mountains just huge like this. I don't know why the emojis are there, but um, they make them huge like this. Well, one, that's really misleading. Two, when you try to print something like this, you're stretching those pixels so much that it's going to look like garbage. So if you're going to do any sort of transform whether it's distort or warp or skew to correct for perspective make sure you're keeping it very minimal you're getting it back to where it was there shouldn't be a huge amount of distortion where you're even needing to stretch those mountains that much but i have seen for some reason a trend where people are making every mountain everest and uh you know if you put it in a one by one crop on a cell phone sure it may look interesting or look cool but if you try to print it, then all of a sudden you're gonna see all this horrible artifacting and stretching in the pixels. So um, if you're doing any sort of perspective correction, you know, keep it minimal, you guys. I just wanna chime in on that. Um, that just because a, a, an image looks good on your monitor or your phone does not mean it's gonna look good in print. Um, we're looking at things at a, a very different resolution on, on a screen versus print. So I think as um, Andrea and Mike, um, suggested earlier is you always want to kind of look at it at a hundred percent on your on your monitor you got to look at it at, at, at you know it's some whatever size you're planning on printing it because if you can see if you can see it there it's going to show up in the print yeah and something that uh drives my workshop participants <laughs> nuts is they'll go mike how do i how do i get my image to look good on my mac 
on my PC at home, on my television screen, and on my cell phone and iPad. I want it to all look the same. And the answer is that's just not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> so that's why it's so important to calibrate and do your proofs and make sure that those are matching up because really like you can have three different computers side by side. You have a Dell, a Mac, a PC, an iPad, whatever. And that image is always going to look a little bit different um, unless everything is perfectly calibrated. Yeah. Um, so I guess we're, we're, for, are we firmly ensconced in the Q and a at this point in time, Mike? Sure. Yeah. Let's answer some questions if people are chiming in. Okay. Um, so Eric, I want you to scan through the chat and there's a couple of very specific questions about you know monitor calibration and stuff i think you can best answer those um and i think um jim are asked they in the Go can I ask, is that am i looking at the chat or the q a the chat you want me to look the, the chat. chat yeah so uh jim asks why not use nikon camera matching isn't that closer to what nikon wishes the rendering from their scenes so yes, so yeah, obviously the cameras have their own specific profiles, right? So that was uh, pretty evident when we get, went into Lightroom and could do camera matching. Um, just because, and obviously I shoot Nikon, I'm ambassador with them, just because Nikon says, hey, this is how the image look is not necessarily how I want it to look. So I find the color profile that matches best to my vision and what I want the scene to look like, not necessarily what is said to be the proper profile for that camera. So it's kind of maybe going against the grain a little bit, but I, I'd much rather find what works for me than what is supposed to be. Um, um, I can. I was going to ask, somebody, somebody asked here about doubling image size. Um, and Adobe did come out with something um, last year called super resolution. I think it, they should call it super size me because it, it actually, in some cases, really does work. Uh, so what I recommend you do is Google um, Julianne Cost, K-O-S-T, who is a really great mm -hmm. instructor, and uh, look up, uh, so Julianne Cost and uh, put in super resolution, and she has a great video on, on how it works on older files. Um, it can only be used once. It, it has to work either on a, a JPEG or a DNG file, but I would go look up her information on it because it, it, um, she's a great teacher and she does a good job on it. Another um, another software, I don't know if you guys have any experience with this, Topaz, Gigapixel, I believe it is, um, that, that does a pretty pretty decent job at times on upsizing if you need to, but still limitations to it. Yeah, I, I guess I would say I found that the AI tools in Adobe seem to do a little better job than Topaz. Sometimes Topaz, I have found, does generate some digital artifacts more yeah. than the super resolution tool. In Adobe. Cool. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. I think we've answered a lot of these questions. Um, Eric, there were some questions in the chat about like setting up your monitor for, for profiling. Like Richard asked um, D65 or D50 on calibration. Um, um, I think I would, I would, um, I think at D65, I, I can double check with, uh, Joe Frio, who is our, um, expert on all that, but I'm pretty sure it's D65. Yeah. And so a lot of, I want to address calibration briefly, cause I'm getting some questions. I've gotten some questions where I'm not really sure of how people are calibrating. So Apple has, and kind of an in monitor calibration piece of software that's pretty worthless, um, it's basically going to try kind of get your colors right for your monitor and your contrast is going to be way too high. You need an external calibrating device and they're made by two companies as far as I know. And one is Spider, and the other one is Calibrite. I personally own a Calibrite calib calibration device. It's very simple to use. It costs about 180 bucks. I think um, you can you can buy more expensive ones that'll also let you calibrate your photo papers and, you know, um, your camera and other devices. But um, for printing, you have to have one of those devices. This is not not a question. You're just guessing what your monitor is telling you uh, if you don't have a calibration device. 
And it's always fun too when you calibrate and then at the very end, it's like, here's what your monitor looked like before. And here's what your monitor looks like after it's calibra uh, calibrated. Sometimes you cringe a little bit. Yeah, I guarantee you it's gonna look not as bright and the color's not gonna look quite as saturated. And if that's the way it looks, it's probably right. Because you have also to remember, the other yeah, your print, a print is a reflective medium. You know, your screen is a projection medium. So it's projecting light right at you. Your print, the light hits the image, you know, hits the pigment in the inks or the black and white, uh, you know, the silver in the paper. And then that light bounces back to your eye. So, you know, it's not like a rear projection. Also, too, to make sure that you're not sending in sRGB color profiles for print. Yeah. Those are going to be your, your web profiles. Yeah. So Jerry asks, says, where can I find a list of soft proofing paper and printing combinations that were previously in Photoshop? Well, previously, I don't know how old you're talking about, Jerry, but if you're looking for old ICC profiles, then I'm sure that somebody's got them squirreled away somewhere. But... I really couldn't direct you to somewhere. And my other question would be, why would you want that? Um, but uh, unless it's older printer software and you're trying to get a closer match. Uh, my recommendation would be um, also for soft proofing, it just wouldn't do it. It's not very accurate. It doesn't really render very good results. And it causes more trouble actually that I've, we found than, um, than it's worth. So, uh, trust what your monitor is telling you in Adobe RGB, and then run some test prints either on your own printer or with your preferred lab, which should be digital silver imaging. <laughs> I, I just want to jump back in. I did confirm with Joe Frio um, that D6500 is the D65 is the correct um, setting when you're doing your monitor calibration. And um, I also uh, I also just posted in the chat I, uh, the actual YouTube video from Julianne Cost on using super resolution. So that is uh, now in the chat. So I, I had a uh, workshop participant actually text me earlier, asked me to ask you guys this. I'm curious to see your, your answer. How do you decide on what is the limitation of a print size versus the resolution of an image? So if you have, you're shooting, say the Z8 and you're shooting 40, 45 megapixels, mm -hmm. what's your limitation on that? It's, it, I will answer that in, in that it's the, uh, uh, you know, it, it really depends on the beholder. I mean, I've seen Tri-X negatives shot at 1600 back in the day, blown up to 40 by 60. And you, at that size, you see every piece of grain possible, but- yeah. You know, I mean, you could look at some of those old photographs of the Beatles and you see them blown up to 40 by 60. You see all that grain. But you know what? If that's OK with you, that's fine. It's hard to say exactly how big you can go unless you, um, you know, we can make you a proof of an image at different sizes. Like if you said, I want to see it this at uh, 30 by 40 and 40 by 60. We can actually do a couple of strips for you on a piece of paper with the image size to that and offer you the ability to. Um, you know, see that on a strip of paper. Um, if you have your own printer, you can frankly do the same thing. You can size it to the size you want to see it at and just do a section and in a critical area of the image, print it out, see what it looks like. Um, it's um, because really what you tolerate and what somebody else tolerates are going to be two different things. Yeah. And, and that kind of leads me into what I, I had a discussion with, with them about too is, you're not, it's like you blow up a 12 megapixel image to 40 by 60. You're not supposed to be looking at prints from three inches away. You know, <laughs> that, that, go look at a billboard. You know, you're going to be very upset at the quality of a print on a billboard, but yet from 100 feet away, that billboard image looks, you know, great. So, really, you know, don't, don't smush your face up against a print and be inspecting that closely that's not how these images are supposed to be viewed but step you know five six seven feet away from it and appreciate it from there and you, you're all of a sudden going to have so much more leniency to what you can print in regards to megapixel versus size mike i am so glad you said that we just did a, a trade show in las vegas and people were 
you know, they were standing up in front of a print and, and they were saying, well, what about this? What about that? And I said, step back. Do you see the same thing? This is the appropriate viewing distance, not up right on top of it. So it's a, it's a great, great point. Um, I, and I agree with it a hundred percent. I I just went to a friend's gallery show and I, uh, a friend of mine, she came with me and I saw her like literally like two inches away. And I looked at her and go, what does it smell like? Yeah. <laughs> so, so these images are not yeah. scratch and sniffs. So, yeah. so yeah. Scott has a question for us. He says, uh, do you recommend Adobe RGB or pro photo RGB color space when ingesting? Um, and I have an opinion here, Scott, but I mean, Scott, Mike, um, Mike question from Scott. So I am in Adobe, uh, pro photo or, uh, you guys there? Yeah, we're here. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Every, everybody, everybody just froze for a second there. I was like, oh no, here we go. We almost made it. Uh, so I like Adobe. Um, that's just my personal preference there. Yeah. So I, I have something to say, um, from a kind of a technical, my understanding from a technical standpoint, the pro photo color space is much larger than the Adobe uh, color space. So you're going to be seeing more color probably in your monitor if you're actually working in pro photo. The problem is that that color space will not translate to print. So a lot of those colors you're seeing, if you're going to print, you're simply going to be, you what you're what's going to happen is you're going to get an interpolation where your computer is going to be deciding what to replace those colors with. So you're not going to get as accurate a print rendition as working in Adobe RGB, if that makes sense. And kind of the, in, we all said this question about, should I be working in sRGB or RGB straight? And the, and Mike and I talked about that. So Mike, why don't you answer that question? In regards to sRGB? Versus Adobe RGB, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sRGB is going to just be what you're going to have displayed best for web. So any anytime that I am editing, like for my images to be on my website, uh, like a digital portfolio, I'll have sRGB, right? Um, but if I'm going to go for print, then sRGB is not going to be the, uh, the option there, right? So... sRGB is what I will do for anything where it's going to be web-based, whether it's social media or website, um, but definitely not for print. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, you know, Rita asked, do you shoot in RGB? Um, well, uh, yes, you shoot in yeah. raw. Um, and so, you know, just people get a better understanding when you're shooting in raw, you're basically getting everything that your camera sensor has to offer. So there's really no, you know, if you want the best possible outlet out, output, you know, then shoot in raw. I mean, if you want a small file, then you can shoot in JPEG, but you're not going to get the best possible output. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about this too prior, like when I used to shoot sports, anything that had to be on the wire like that, it was JPEG because you just didn't have the time to say, oh, I'm going to edit this. You know, I'm going to really see the dynamic ranges of this. I'm going to like you, you had to have images up and ready to go within seconds. So JPEG there works. And that's when you're really trying to, you know, make sure everything is as perfect as possible in the camera, but weddings, portrait, landscapes, night sky, wildlife, you really want to be shooting in some sort of raw that way, when you have the time to sit down with a coffee or something and really edit, you have all the data there for you to just go crazy. Don't go crazy, crazy with, but to go crazy with in your edits and you have that there. Um, and the thing to, to remember too, is when you are shooting on, um, on raw, it's always going to come out a bit more flat, a little less saturated, a little less contrasty. That's what, because you have the data to build all that in and you have to build it in. It doesn't just come out that way. If you shoot JPEG, it's gonna be compressed. It's gonna have a little bit more saturation, a little bit more contrast to it. But the moment that you start to do any sort of editing to it, you're all of a sudden going to start breaking down the quality of the image. So I, 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 I wanna chime in on one thing there because someone also asked about that in black and white. I'm not sure if we addressed this, but it, it goes for this same thing. Even though you're gonna, uh, you wanna, have black and white images unless you have a dedicated camera like the Leica monochrome 
you should always shoot in in adobe raw get all the color um, and then work in lightroom or the nick silver fx pro to convert that file to black and white but you're going to have a much you can have the broadest color space you have to work with even for your black and white files and, and to kind of bounce off black and white um i get this at, uh, a lot when we're on the workshops i will if i see a scene that is screaming hey mike this is black and white i will switch over in my color profile to monochromatic in the camera um now just because i switch over to monochromatic in the the nikon system it's still going it's going to give me a jpeg preview on the back of the camera of what it looks like in monochromatic but the actual raw file is still going to be color and i like to do that though because your eye, you don't see black and white, right? So when I'm out there shooting and I'm going, this is 100% gonna be a black and white scene, I wanna try and see what it's gonna look like when I am ready to edit it in Lightroom or Photoshop. I don't wanna kind of guess, okay, is this gonna look good? So that's why I do switch it over, but that doesn't have any overall effect to the final raw image that comes off the camera. Um, so somebody asked, um, Mike, uh, if uh, you were self-taught in Lightroom or did you take some course? And I just posted a link to your website in the chat, um, you know, which is um, mikemazulphotography.com um, and to your page where you actually offer courses in uh, photo editing and Lightroom and Photoshop. So that's in the chat. And yeah, so I was actually, I was taught by a pack of wolves in a cave beneath a volcano. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, I was self-taught, you know, I, I started off uh, shooting film for about 10 years. Um, and uh, it was back in the back in the day when I would ride my bike to the library. I'd go through this thing called a card catalog. I'd find photography books. I would bike home. I would take pictures of very manly things like flowers and ladybugs in my parents' front yard. And then I would mow lawns and go to Eckerd's drugstore and get it developed and then look and pay the extra 99 cents to get the contact sheet and look and see what I could have done differently. Um, so that's how I learned to shoot. And then when it came to editing, um, you know, it was all self-taught. It was all just, okay, let me get in here. Let me see, you know, what this slider does and what it affects and how it affects it. And at that time, you know, luckily uh, there was more online tutorials available. So I didn't have to ride my bike to, 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 the, to the library. Um, but yeah, all self-taught. I've actually um, never taken a photography class. Uh, I've taken a photojournalism class, but not a photography class. So a lot of trial and error. Um, but that Patreon site that you posted is, is pretty fun. A monthly subscription for I think it's like $35. We meet twice a month and we have some sort of educational session. Um, you know, the past three have been very, very focused on the solar eclipse. Um, before that, it was like luminosity masking, a little bit more advanced stuff into Photoshop, but then also more basic stuff into some of the new tools in Lightroom. You know, we talk about planning for you know all sorts of different things. Uh, so it's a big, it's a it's a big nerding out, but it's really fun. Uh, it's all through Zoom, so everybody gets to chime in and ask questions. And um, yeah, so that's that's that class. So I, I just wanted to oh, hold on. I'm just going to offer one. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. We just have a. I want to answer a couple more questions, and we're we're at uh, over an hour and a half now. So I think we're going to need to take a couple more questions and wrap it up. Um, so sorry to be a party pooper, but uh, we could probably go all day. Um, uh, but um, so go ahead, Eric, jump in. Yeah, I, I did see a question that maybe got to, um, removed. But so, someone had a question about, you know, their own printer. And um, it was the Canon Pro 100. And I, um, I followed but, up with that one. It, I, okay. I hope you don't mind. Okay, yeah. thanks. But, no, but, but I, I do, do, do want to it. Yeah, I guess I want to say that people often ask us about printers. Like, you know, we're not opposed to people buying printers at home. Just keep in mind a couple things. If you don't do a ton of printing, um, but you're thinking, you, you know, first of all, you should be printing. You should be printing as many images as possible, um, big, little, whatever. But the point is your ability to sort of get a different experience of holding a print is totally different than looking at them on a, on a monitor. You could go to Costco and print out a hundred four by sixes and tape them to a wall for, for all I care. And then make a choice about what really matters by looking at a physical 
print, it's going to be a very different experience. And it's actually very rewarding to start printing your own work. Um, with that said, um, we switched from Epson to Canon about 10 years ago, and I've never looked back. Um, we have been incredibly happy with what Canon provides in terms of um, color quality. The, their, their workflow is great. We have very few breakdowns. We have had a Canon Pro 1000 here for 12 years. It just finally needed to replace the head. And I can't tell you how many prints we run through that thing. So if you're looking, you know, if you wanted our advice on buying a printer and budget is a thing, I would look at the Canon uh, Image ProGraph 300. It prints up to 13 by 19, uses pigmented inks as, as opposed to dye inks, which are more archival. And then if you want something printed larger, the beauty of the Image ProGraph printers is that from your 13 inch ProGraph 300 all the way up to our 60 inch printer, it's the same ink set. So if you said, I just wanna be able to make some small prints at home, but I'm gonna have a show and I need to do 20 by 24s and can't do that. If you're working with a Canon printer, we're gonna be talking the same language. So it really, really helps. I, and I don't get paid by Canon to say that. We are a, we have been extremely happy with their support and the quality and longevity of their product. Well, and if I can just add one thing to that, you know, when people ask me when I'm at a trade show at a dealer's, whatever, I always say I'm printer agnostic because our, our papers work well with Epson and Canon. Anecdotally, I can tell you that my husband, Dennis, has the Pro 1000, has had it for several years and just loves it and has never had issues. But Eric, you make a, a good point um, that for most people that are printing their own work, either a 13 or 17 inch printer works for most everything you're gonna print, but occasionally you wanna go bigger. And in the case of Dennis, when he does, he has someone that he's worked with in Los Angeles for 30 years. So it's great to have have that relationship with somebody like DSI because um, you have the option to to make much larger prints. So um, just uh, I'm trying to answer as many questions here as I, we can. So I just want to get to a couple more. So um, let's see, I had one here, uh, which is about monitors. Um, so what translates better to print? Um, 4k monitor or 2k does it make a difference do we have any answers on that i, no, I mean not, yeah go ahead Mike. Got, i appreciate it i was gonna say i i personally i like the older monitors um not like the super high retina models uh monitors like i have uh next to me here i have a old uh imac monitor and uh, these things seem to be gold now amongst people, like photographers wanting to get these uh, versus like the the super duper, you know, 4K retinas. But that's just my my personal thoughts there. Yeah, my only chime in would say that 4K, I think, is great if you're doing video um, mm -hmm. and a lot of video editing. I think that's why they're so good. But a good 2K monitor, you know, we have a selection of BenQ and um, ISO monitors here, and we're, we're happy with both. I also have a BenQ uh, that's in storage right now. That's really nice to, to edit for and edit on uh, for print. But yeah, now you mentioned the 4K. Um, I drug my Volcano video over. Uh, it's not 4K screen, so it looked like garbage on there. And I drug it back over onto my 4K monitor. I was like, oh, thank God. Like it looks good over here. So yeah. yeah, if you're doing video work, then 4K, 100%. Yep. So Candace asks, when you print, do you save image to Adobe RGB in Lightroom or Adobe Pro? So uh, Lightroom, Lightroom doesn't give you the ability to change your color profile uh, or color space. So it by default, it is um, RGB, I believe it is. Um, but yeah, that's when you export uh, and make sure I got the question right. But when I export, I'm exporting into uh, Profoto. Does that make sense? I, I might have gotten a question mixed up there. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, yeah. So Candace asks, when you print, do you save image to Adobe RGB in Lightroom? Um, so uh, that's another reason why you might want to, if you have Photoshop, to export it from Photoshop if you can. 
you could do all your editing in Lightroom and then do your print export to a TIFF um, in uh, Photoshop. And something to kind of bounce off that too, real quick in regards to TIFFs, you know, people ask me, do you, do you send your printer TIFFs? Um, I think that's talk, talk to whoever you're printing with, you know, like what they, they require. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Mike. So for example, we have two ways to make prints with us. We have custom printing and in custom, we have our technicians actually look at your file to make sure there's nothing wrong before it goes into our, you know, before we actually print it. Then we have a, an online direct to print service, which is you save a little money by doing that. But because it is an online application, it will only take a JPEG. Now, there's nothing wrong with printing from a JPEG. It's just the fact that you can get more data into a TIFF than a JPEG. Most of the time people, and I would always edit, I wouldn't edit in JPEG or shoot in JPEG, but exporting to a JPEG, um, you know, it's it's not optimal, but it's not bad either. I mean, it's a, it's a slim difference. Most people can't tell. Have you guys had any experience? Because I know it's kind of a new thing with JPEG extra large. Um, JPEG extra large. I guess that's like super size me. I don't yeah. personally, <laughs> Eric. Do, do you have any any word on the JPEG peg extra large? Um, no. And in, in terms of, I mean, I guess, you know, as a, my my understanding would be JPEG still is doing some compression. Um, but if you're exporting, like if you've worked on a TIFF and you export it to a level 10 or 12 JPEG, and because I don't know about this X, this new um, size, and then you, you know, you want to use our value print service, uh, our direct to print service, um, you're going to be fine. Um, you know, unless you're going, we kind of stop at 30 by 40 on our value print service because above that, we I would recommend um, using TIFFs and then going through our custom. So I do not know about that newer JPEG. So, um, oh, yeah, I think I think that at this point, I think this is a good point for us to basically say thank you to our participants um, and especially those that have stuck with us for this entire time. And uh, the, wow, this we still have over a hundred people online with us. So thank you all. And uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you want to watch parts of this again, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. So just look up digital silver imaging on YouTube. And um, thank you all for the excellent questions. There were a few very specific questions like about Nikon and stuff that I, I just felt didn't appeal. You know, I couldn't get to in this in this segment, but um, hey, maybe a future webinar, Mike. Um, yeah. So. And, and if anybody has any Nikon specific questions, they can always shoot me uh, an email through my website too. I'll be more than happy to help them out. Yeah. And sign up, sign up for Patreon. Um, Mike has an yep. excellent newsletter. So if you go to his uh, website, you can sign up for his, you know, his emails. Um, he posts some really good stuff in there and he runs some amazing workshops, which I would push more, but they're always sell out. So, um, and Veronica. What, well, I just wanted to add one thing that was mentioned a few times. I think the fact that you offer looking at one image on three different papers is a, is a terrific option. Um, you know, I look at that image Mike was working with, and to me, it says photorag metallic. But I bet if you showed some people that same image on, say, photorag ultra smooth or a textured paper, you'd get three different opinions on which which was their favorite. So I think that is a huge, huge advantage to look at one image and even on a traditional silver gelatin paper. So I encourage people to to take advantage of that. And I Thanks just posted that, that yeah. link in the chat. It's our print sample promotion where you can get three papers, three uh, th try three different papers from one image. And so that link is in the chat. It's called our print sample promotion if you go to our website. And I, and I will say just on that too, you can obviously, the welcome discount does apply to that. And um, it's a very affordable service and you get $25 back towards your next order to use within within 30 days of receiving your prints. So, you know, we're obviously here to encourage people to print because I guarantee if you haven't done a lot of printing, 
the tactile yeah. experience of holding your work is just so much better. We it's that long an hour talking. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, go no. Ahead. I was just going to say, it's that long process coming full circle, right? You know, and like you think about a trip, right? It's like you go, you, you, you book your trip, you, you pack your bags, you fly out there, you, you suffer through being hungry, cold, wet, you know, kiss <laughs> situations not working out, and then finally get the shot you want. Then you pack it back up, you head home, you edit, and then like seeing it on the computer is cool but when you have that tangible print and you like can hang it up and you can look at it and be like i suffered for that photo right. <laughs> like, you know that like there's something really special about seeing everything like to just come full circle it or if they work the with you or if they back. work with you mike if they work with you mike it's like i risked my life with mike and zool <laughs> yeah. and here's my proof well, I need to actually talk to you guys because I talked about uh, scratch and sniff photos. I need to start getting some of my volcano prints to start smelling like sulfur dioxide. So it actually brings people into the scene a little bit more. Um, we don't so have those. We'll... We do have, we can put, <laughs> actually, we have a new technology where you can put your hands up to your volcano prints and they just radiate heat. There you go. Done. Done. <laughs> okay. Well, I can see that this webinar is devolving. <laughs> So I'd like to thank everybody and, um, you know, stay tuned for our next webinar and please start printing on Hanamiya yes. paper. Mm. Yeah. And we'll be sending you out a, um, a follow-up email just reminding you about um, this. We'll, we'll send a link to the recording that you can, you can watch, share with people who, you know, may didn't, you know, they're going to be so jealous that you got to it and they didn't. And uh, there'll be a reminder of the promotions that we're offering. So thank you all again. And I can't, thank uh, Mike enough and Veronica. It's, I love working with you on these things. And we've done webinars with Veronica on choosing the right paper and, and uh, which are also on our YouTube channel. So um, just uh, really appreciate everybody's attention today and all hundred of you that stayed with us the whole time yes. and everybody else. So thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks Hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks, you guys. Yep. Yeah, thanks thank you guys. Everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. See you guys.